Thank you. Um, so maybe I should start by recalling what I was uh, saying yesterday. So the setting was uh, as follows. So um, I take inside A, um, say an algebraic sovereignty. of a co-dimension uh, higher than two. And um, A, of course, is an Abelian variety. And we have the following diagram. So on the left-hand side, say Z times JLA. So JLA, like that being the vertical fiber of the F jet space of the Abelian variety A times this uh, part in uh, algebra, continue algebra, going to uh, the L jet space of A, which decomposes as A times JLA. So this map I called Psi Z yesterday. So I will not recall how it, uh, how it is written, uh, but the important fact is that if, so I will complete the diagram just after that, If I take a section on that space, an algebraic section of uh, some power of an ample line bundle on A, they so pull back, pulled back from the base A, by A being the projection. So if I take a section like that, that vanishes along the image of psi z, meaning that if I pull it back by psi z, I get zero, then we have the following. Then for any disk, I write the disks in that way, for any disk falling inside A such that f of 0 belongs to z, one has that the pullback of this section, so if you see that section as a green Griffith jet differential on A, you can pull it back by uh, this uh, L cliff of S, and so the consequence of this vanishing is that the order of vanishing at 0 of this section is at least L plus 1. Okay, so we have uh, this map that satisfies this. And uh, another feature of this map is that if you look at the projection <laughs> towards uh, the vertical fiber JLA, this diagram happens to be locally trivial on the base. So locally, uh, this diagram identifies with some embedding of uh, a nth thickening of Z inside A. But let me recall that this uh, nth thickening is not the same. So maybe it's not an embedding, sorry. This map, this uh, thickening is not the same as that one. It's not the trivial thickening. Yes. Sigma, uh, oh, sorry, it's S. Thank you. S is sigma. Thank you. Um, this uh, thickening is not embedded trivially inside that space. It is uh, somehow twisted uh, by a formula which I explained uh, yesterday. <coughs> um, so it's totally this diagram on the base. Okay. And now we want to find a section for each L, we want to find a section SL satisfying what is written on this board with a twist ML not too large. And so 
what we just have to do is to count the dimensions. Uh, so how the notation I will use. Okay, so maybe I should write the sorry. Okay. These two maps I will denote by uh, pi in both cases. <laughs> so what I want to do actually is to find a section of the push forward on uh, JLA of this uh, line bundle. So maybe I should rewrite above. So look at uh, that uh, exact sequence. So push uh, down by pi this um, way, this lift to the total jet space of A of the ample line model A uh, L on A, and so we have now a way of pulling back the sections of this by the map psi. And what we want to do is to find a section of the kernel of that map, a section of this, a global section, say, on the base JLA of that, such that if you restrict it to Z, so if you restrict it to uh, the, the image of this psi z, sorry, you get zero. So we want a global section in So global section on the base of this uh, push forward, uh, on the base of this map phi, which is vertical fiber of the total jet of the total jet space of A of this color. And so to do that, we just have to count dimensions. So if I call that uh, E1 and this E2, we have That the rank so of E1, uh, so E1 is uh, actually a locally free shift. And if you want to compute uh, its rank, you just have to use this uh, trivialization here of the map pi. So locally, uh, E1 identifies with, um, say, the rank. Um, of the global section of the pullback of this line bundle, M, on that space, in this earth thickening. So this is an earth thickening. So you get uh, L plus 1 times the rank, well, or the dimension, rather, of this gamma on Z of this pullback, which is just actually the restriction of Z of this uh, mth power of the line bundle L. And this, since Z is of co-dimension higher than 2, maybe let me write that way, this is something like a constant times m to the power dimension of z. So it grows at least as m to the power dimension of a minus 2. And similarly, for the, uh, e2, this is uh, even easier. Uh, sorry, what did I say? I, I thought about uh, I'm talking about this restriction. So this is e two, the restriction of L to this thickening of the. And E1, it's even easier. 
rank of E1. It is just the dimension on the space of total uh, sections of this on the vertical fiber L A. So this grows like M to the power dimension. Okay, so everything is, uh, L here is fixed, but now I'm allowing it to vary. So if we take So if you recall in the statement of the, the lemma, I uh, had this uh, sequence and L, which I wanted to put actually as uh, the power here. So I wish to have a sequence and L such that this kernel is not zero. And also I wanted an L to be negligible compared to L. And so what I uh, will do now is to take an L, which is much smaller than L, but also, say, much larger than L to the power, well, to the square root of L. So if I do that, and I plug an L instead of M here, we find, so let me be a, little bit clearer, since this QLM also depends on M, I will introduce it in the notation. So if you take M being equal to NL that way, and plug a, replace M by NL, then you will find that the kernel has positive rank, generically. Just have to, uh, in you replace uh, M by L, N of L, and you find that this is uh, much uh, smaller than this M to the power dimension because of this minus two. Uh, yes, you're right. Sorry. I want this to be much smaller than that, so that the color is good. Thank you. <coughs> okay, and so if we have this, uh, then the global section on the base of this UNL, the algebraic global section of this affine space, actually, uh, of that sheaf, which is not uh, very um, explicit somehow, but we know that uh, this this sheaf have global, has global sections as soon as we have this condition. But note that, for example, we don't have any control of the uh, degree of uh, these sections seen as uh, green Griffith jet differentials. And to do that, we would need to know which pole order we need to put at infinity somehow to have uh, global sections. So, yeah, the finer analysis would be required. Okay, and so uh, this ends the proof of the lemma. That's the thing. So we have this algebraic separate that happen too. We have an entire curve inside A, which is very skin dense. And we have the sequence in L satisfying this and the sections SL. This property I'm not going to recall completely. But there are, say, uh, green Griffith dead differentials on A with a twist, positive twist, given by this exponent n of f. And they satisfy uh, this property. Okay, and so with these ingredients, we are able 
bound from above the counting function of f with respect to z. Uh, it goes to zero. It's the end of this. Okay, so we are also given uh, some um, epsilon positive. And what we want to do is to prove that the counting function truncated at order one for, for f with respect to uh, z is bounded from above by this epsilon uh, times uh, characteristic function. So to do that, pick L and size, fix L so large that uh, N of L divided by L is, uh, say, it's smaller than epsilon over 2. And now, thanks to the condition that I have just erased, which uh, is uh, which I should have written here, we have that, say, so if you consider the counting function of f with respect to z at order 1, we know that each time the curve passes through a z, then it has a um, multiplicity l plus 1 for this sl. So it implies that l plus 1 times this counting function is smaller than the counting function of the lift of f at order l with respect to uh, the zero divisor of SL. And now apply the second main theorem, the first main theorem <coughs> to uh, SL. So uh, to do that precisely, maybe I will, uh, I will write that here. Let me introduce a compactification as I did uh, yesterday. So compactify the vertical fiber or even the total jet space of A by including a divisor at infinity, which I will denote H of L. And uh, now if you have a section S of L uh, on uh, the open part of this uh, compactification, you can see S of L as a section on that compactification of, of course, the pullback of L to the power N of L. And now you have to take into account the divisor at infinity. And here you have some power, uh, say, big N, on which you have no control. That is what I see. Uh, just as I explained that we don't know exactly what with for order you need to put on SL to have a global section. OK, so now you can apply the first main theorem to the section SL, and you find uh, the characteristic function of that thing. So this is smaller than the characteristic function of f with respect to l uh, times nl plus the characteristic function of uh, the lift fl with respect to this divisor at infinity times this integer n. Okay, and now, well, of course, you can imagine what will follow. You pass this L plus one on the right hand side, and you find that you have this counting function, of, which becomes smaller than L, N of L divided by that. So smaller than epsilon over two times the characteristic function of F with respect to L, sorry, plus n, this integer on which we have no control, divided by l plus 1 <laughs> times this l lift of f with respect to hl. 
And now to conclude, you apply the tautological inequality, which tells you that the characteristic function of the health lift of any uh, anterior curve inside A, with respect to the divisor at infinity you put in a compactification of that space, is negligible compared to the characteristic say any characteristic function on the base with respect to an ample line bundle. Sorry, yes. Um, let me do that board. All right, and now you see that the proof uh, ends here because uh, this logarithm will be smaller than epsilon over two as soon as you increase this exceptional subset which appears in the second in the tautological inequality. All right. uh, maybe let me write the final statements so that you are not uh, so what is proven in the end is that you have that the counting function of f with respect to d is smaller outside some exceptional subset than the characteristic function of f with respect to an ample line bundle. So the counting function of f with respect to this co-dimension two cycle is very small compared to uh, that function. Right, so that was the baby case of the theorem. Um, I may, maybe now I will uh, give you some strengthenings. Okay. Or maybe I give you directly the application because I don't need the strengthenings to do that. Yeah. Okay, I will give you the application because I think it's uh, maybe nicer. And for the strengthenings, actually, what I wanted to explain to you will not surprise anyone given what we have explained so far. So maybe I will be a little bit quicker. Okay, so application. So using that, we can prove the pretty very nice theorem. So I will simplify a bit the hypothesis because I don't want to be too technical. So assume the following. So it's a unicity statement. Um, so assume we are given two abelian varieties. A1, A2. And inside these two varieties, I will take two uh, divisors, two ample divisors. In uh, the abelian varieties AI, and I will assume to simplify that they are irreducible and uh, with uh, trivial stabilizers. So two divisors with uh, which are both ample, irreducible. So we could uh, remove uh, some of this uh, hypothesis, but in the end we would get a slightly weaker statement. So what is this unity state? Unity statement. So assume now that you are given two the risky dense entire curves. Such that if you pull back these two divisors, then you get the same support inside C. Okay, so it doesn't seem too strong, but what is the conclusion of the theorem? So I think you can guess. So then there is an isomorphism between the data of 
A1, D1, and A2, D2 that brings one curve to the other. So an isomorphism of A1 towards A2 that brings D1 to D2 and such that if you first compose F1 with this isomorphism, you find F2. Okay, so it's, uh, it seems to me a very strong result. <coughs> Yeah, A1 is equal to A2. Everything is equal uh, just because you have uh, this equality. And it's also, I emphasize that it's the supports that are the same. So not, the multiplicities are not relevant at all. Okay, so. Uh, well, here, if you take two abelian varieties, so. Uh, if you see, I'm not even assuming that they are the same dimension. So, ah, you mean you start from the same A? Um, well, I think it's a categorical problem somehow. I, I don't know if it makes sense to say that uh, if you are assuming that A1 and A2 are isomorphic to begin with, I think maybe you can have an automorphism sending uh, D1 to D2 if you simply translate them. Um, yeah, the question would rather be, does uh, exist one unique? Uh, I'm not so sure about that. Uh, yeah. Maybe it's, yeah, I don't know, actually. Okay, so let me um, do the proof. So the proof will be to, of course, produce a correspondence between A1 and A2 and show that it is actually an element. So let us be inside uh, the product of A1 and A2 be uh, the Zariski closure. Of um, well, the curve given by the two coordinates. F1, F2. So you have uh, the following diagram. You have A2, A1. And now, of course, we have Bloch's theorem, which tells you that B is an Abelian variety inside that product. By Bloch or Chi. So we have to prove that B is a correspondence, giving an item. So uh, first, there is a quite simple fact that if you pull back the two divisors to B, actually you get uh, the, the same thing. Uh, so that we that we will that will be what we have to prove as the starting point. Maybe lemma. So we have I will call by two by one the two projections. Okay, so assume uh, it's not the case. So if it's not the case, by the hypothesis I made about the irreducibility of D1 and D2, actually it's easy to see that they cannot, these two cycles cannot have any component in common because any uh, irreducible component of one of these pullback get sent to uh, D1 or D2, depending on the case. So if not, these two have no component in common. Uh, 
Uh, sorry? Yes, so I called pi to the map starting from B. Um, yeah, maybe it's not the best, uh, but yeah. I hesitated of calling pi to the map starting from A1 times A2. Yeah. Okay, so if uh, they are not equal, actually, you can show, well, it's easy to see that they must have no component in common because if they had some component in common, then projecting this component towards even uh, uh, either of A1 or A2, you would get the full D1 or D2. And then uh, they would be identified. Uh, what do I want to say? Okay, what I mean to say is that if they have a component in common, actually they must uh, they must be equal. Um, as the image of one common component. Okay, so maybe it's not so true. Let me get back to that, but I um so the what we have to say is that if they are not equal, then the intersection between the two has the dimension higher than two. So if I call that Z, I get a cycle of codimension higher than two. And then you can apply to it the theorem. The main theorem of the article. So then, for any uh, epsilon, I will choose the uh, good choice of epsilon in the end of the proof. So for <laughs> any epsilon, you have this uh, inequality. So say I can pick two ample line bundles on each of these uh, varieties and compute the characteristic function of this product with respect to the product of L1 times A2. So this characteristic function is just the sum of the characteristic function of the two components with respect to any, uh, all of these, um, to the L1 and L2. Okay, but this, since we're assuming that each time F1 passes through D1, F2 also passes through D1, this counting function is actually just uh, one half times the truncated, Counting function with respect to D1 plus the truncated counting function with respect to D2 by our hypothesis on these uh, inverse images of D1 and D2. Okay, so now what? Maybe black box. So apply a second so we are assuming that d1 and d2 are ample so in that situation we have a second main theorem which permits to bound from below these two counting functions by the, the right hand side somehow with some constant which will not that, uh, which will not depend on that side. So each of these characteristic function uh, counting function will be bounded from below by a multiple an adequate multiple of the characteristic function. And now, well, if you take epsilon smaller than um, this C, you get a contradiction. So 
because there is here this exceptional divisor. So contradiction. if epsilon is too small, smaller than this. Okay, so here we are, maybe a little bit fuzzy here, I'll get back to that later. But the idea is that it's impossible for these two inverse images to have a small intersection. And from that you deduce that these two divisors have the same pullback. And because of this, the end of the proof is to deduce that these two maps, pi 1 and pi 2, have trivial kernel. Look, and um, now you, the, you want to prove what I said, that the kernel of pi 2, for example, is uh, trivial. So if you pick an element inside this kernel, what you can see is that this uh, element k leaves, of course, any fiber of the map by two invariant. But this pullback of d2 by this map by two is equal to the pullback of d1 by the map by one. And so this element k in the kernel of pi 2, which identifies to a1, actually, leaves this d1 invariant. But we assumed at the beginning that D1 and D2 had a, a trivial stabilizer. But the stabilizer of D1 is trivial. So uh, K must be the trivial element. Ah, sorry, maybe I should have said that we, um, we can shift, we can shift inside uh, A1 and A2, the divisors that uh, zero. Uh, is an element of this divide. So k, uh, k must be actually uh, the, the neutral element in A1 seen as a, a group. <coughs> okay, and so uh, B must have uh, trivial fibers and the same uh, above uh, A2 and the same for B above A1. So actually we have an isomorphism. Note that these maps are subjective because we assume that f is RSP dense inside both of A1 and A2. So the Zariski closure P must be dominant above the Zariski closure in A1. Okay, and B also uh, trivially transports F1 to F2 if you see it as a correspondence towards A1, uh, from A1 towards A2, because it contains the what would be the, the graph of the function from A1 towards A2. Okay, so yeah, I think the only thing about is that the point, uh, but I don't think it is too, uh, too hard to read. I, I think the basic idea is that if they have a component in common, you can deduce quite easily that you have it. Okay, uh, so I have. 20 minutes, yes. So D1 and D2 are irreducible, but the pullback might not be, I think. Uh, it's not so clear. I think if you have something like that, maybe you can imagine that you have uh, what, something uh, with uh, several irreducible components upstairs. Yeah, 
So um, I think you have to pick one component and say that if, so you know that each irreducible component upstairs will be dominant on the base, but what's not really clear is that if I assume that, so I call uh, E that irreducible component, so my hypothesis will be that phi one of E is D1, phi two of E is D2. So we have then that, um, this pullback upstairs is the phi one inverse of phi one of e and also the equal to the phi two inverse of <laughs> phi two of e but from that it's not immediate to me that them, they must be the same um, yeah. So, yeah think Okay, so I might have been a little bit too fast. So in Yamanoi's proof, uh, the, the result is more general. So he, he has uh, an additional argument for the components which, uh, on which you don't have, uh, um, on which, yeah, you have excess intersection. Maybe I, will, I can check that and tell you later. All right, so maybe I could give you the strengthenings I told you about uh, towards the, the proof of the, the result in its full generality that I introduced yesterday. Okay. Sorry. So I will present you the the following results. So the strengthening one. So assume that you have the following. You pick an abelian variety, and uh, why uh, any other complex projective variety? And on each of these two things, pick two ample line bundles. So I will consider uh, Zariski and entire curve towards the product. So this A1 of this A times Y, sorry. And what I, I'm going to take also is a cycle of codimension two inside the product. Codimension say higher than two. So I'm going to assume that uh, the if you want, the variation of f inside y is very small compared to the variation of f inside a. So to make that precise, I'm going to assume that the characteristic function of the projection of, of f on the second factor, which I'm going to call fi, uh, fy. So assume that the characteristic function of Fy with respect to M is uh, negligible, say, compared to the characteristic function of Fa this time with respect to M. More precisely, outside an exceptional subset, I take the usual bound as a big O of the logarithm of that function is log R. And then we have the same conclusion. The counting function of respect of f with respect to z is very small outside some exceptional subset compared to the characteristic function of f with respect to f. So here I could have put a, a line bond, an ample line bundle on. A times Y, 
But as you see here, because of this hypothesis, even if I put this term here, it will be bounded by the first one. Okay, so to prove this uh, result, actually, it's a sort of a relative version of what I explained yesterday, but and also yeah. at the beginning of, the, of my talk today. So there are two cases, one easy and one uh, slightly hard, harder. So first case. Um, okay. The first case is the situation where the projection of this cycle Z towards A uh, towards Y, sorry, is not subjective. Then if it's not subjective, you can pick um, divisor on Y in uh, some power of the ample line bundle M, so in this uh, in this linear space for M uh, very big, and then of course you can apply the first main theorem because uh, sorry, I didn't write what I wanted to say. So if it's not on two, you can pick a very ample line bundle on Y whose support contains the inverse image of Z. Such that if you pull back E, you have Z inside. So the image will be uh, some algebraic subset inside Y. You cut it out by a variable, well, a section of a variable line bundle. And then one has, if you count the intersection of F with respect to Z, since each time F passes through Z, it passes, its projection to Y passes through E. You get that upper bound. And now you have the first main theorem telling you that this counting function is smaller than the characteristic function of M times big M, which is N times the characteristic function of F with respect to M, FY with respect to M. And then you have this hypothesis. I'm not going to rewrite that, but by this hypothesis you make here, this is very small compared to that. All right, so this is the easy case. Second case, which is a slightly harder, in which some Oh, it's a relative version of uh, this construction of the sections SL. So this second case is where the Z here projects onto Y. Phi Y of Z is equal to Y. Okay, so in that case, We have a new version of the lemma on the existence of these sections SL. So the lemma states the following. There exist sequences, so NL, again, depending on L, and negligible compared to L. And there exists another sequence, M of L, on which we have no control. Okay, and sections inside this time, the total jet space of A times the total jet space of Y. So sections of what? So sections on these affine bundled of the pullback of the ample line bundle L to the power n of l, so this has not changed. And the pullback, now this time, times the pullback of m to the power m of l, on which we have no control. 
Okay, so I, I think you can imagine where this is going. Once we have these sections, you redo the same proof as before, and now you will have a, count, a characteristic function of that term that will appear. And in the proof, L will be fixed at uh, uh, so high that this is very small. This is smaller than epsilon over two. And you will have this term that appears, but this term will be very small thanks to the total inequality and this uh, star assumption. And so to produce the sections SL, we have to do something which is quite similar to what we did before. So this time we also have a, Some uh, morphism, so the reverse morphism, starting from uh, some non-reduced scheme. So starts from z times j l a. So this has not changed. We also have this thickening, but here I'm going to include j l of y, and we arrive inside the total jet, the product of these two uh, jet spaces which I'm going to write as A times JLA times JLY. And the morphism takes a point on the left-hand side, which I'm going to write in coordinates. So A, oh, sorry, this is the vertical file, JLA. So I pick a point inside Z, I pick a jet inside JLA, I pick the data of a point plus jet inside y and uh, is epsilon and i send it to so you have this product here on the last term you simply send your w without changing anything point plus jet inside y and on the first two terms i do the same thing as before so a plus this F xi of epsilon, and then all the derivatives up to order F L xi of epsilon. So here, th this term actually does not really uh, appear. It's uh, not so relevant. And again, we have that if S vanishes, if I take an S as above that vanish along the image of that map, you get what we want. Okay. So maybe I'm going to yeah, maybe rewrite the idea. So saying that say SL above vanishes along uh, Psi Z, the image of Psi Z. Means that uh, locally, if I write SL of A plus Psi Z, of P, etc., until W. This is, this vanishes at order L plus one for any psi inside, say, CNL, uh, for any A inside Z, and for any W inside J. So now, if you recall the proof I did yesterday, I had no W here. And I concluded that if I plug in it the health lift of a uh, germ of this, then I found the same, I find the same thing. And now the basic idea is that you can put whatever you want here as a W and you will still have the, the same, uh, the same conclusion. So 
to convince you of that, you can try to prove the following exercise. If I take, so, yeah. I take a polynomial P, say, in two variables, uh, and a formal series such that for any W in C, I have that when I apply this polynomial P of to F of T and W, I find something which has, which vanishes at order L. Then if I put any formal linear series in the place of W, I still have the same. And so if I have SL vanishes vanishing that way um, at order L, when I plug inside in for the first term the lift of a disk, then on the, if I replace W by the lift of the disk on JLY, I will still have the same conclusion. <coughs> Okay, the, does it sound convincing? <coughs> and now to conclude, yeah, I have one minute to explain that. Yeah. So recall that we have a Z that dominates Y. And so to conclude, note that Above now the projection from JLY times. So maybe I will write. We have a local triviality of some diagram. So the diagram on the left hand side will be what I have written about there. On the right hand side, I have the product of my two jet spaces. And instead of projecting to the, the <coughs> vertical fiber JLA only, I project to this to the product of this vertical fiber and the edge jet space of Y. And so again, this diagram is locally trivial. Is locally is above. If I pick now inside that, that product um, jet and a point uh, Y Z inside that uh, jet space, well, above this point. The diagram is on the left hand side identifies with the product of the fiber ZY for the map going from Z to Y. So the product of ZY times some thickening. On the right hand side, you have only A. And so here you have some points. So what I mean is that the diagram is not this time locally trivial, but you have a variation in fibers depending on the point uh, that you choose here. But the fibers are all thickenings of co-dimension two cycles inside A. And so you can do exactly the same dimension count to count the rank of the, the projection to that space of this um, of the shift, the structural shift of that image, or the pullback of the two line ample line bundles on that image, and the same on the right hand side, and you have 
one, you will be able to choose an integer n of l for the power appearing as a power of uh, the line bundle l exactly in the same way as before. The proof ends by the same dimension curve lecture. <clears throat> All right, so maybe I should uh, stop here. Um, yeah. So tomorrow I won't have a lot of things to say, I must admit. So maybe I will just finish some details that I have not explained and um, maybe end earlier than uh, well, if it's okay for you. Well, thank you. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah, right. Yeah, it's uh, the picture of the points on that side. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Maybe I can explain that to you a bit tomorrow if I uh, find uh, the time to look at it. It's, uh, yeah, exactly, because the idea is that between the first truncation function and the total one, you have something which is morally of co-dimension two. So passing through, through to a point which will give you a contribution to nk, but not a1, and one is something of co-dimension two in the higher object space. Um, but you still need to know somehow that you have a truncation function. So it's rather subtle, but because you need to know that uh, for some nk it will work, you have this. Um, you cannot go from n infinity directly to n1. You need to have another argument to. Uh, Mm. 
It's uh, explicitly written. Okay. Hmm. Yeah, that might be. Uh, so I haven't looked at too much at the details. So before tomorrow, maybe it uh, could be a bit difficult. But I can try. I can. Try. <laughs> right. Thank you.